But uh, yes, her name is Kaisa and she's coming up here on stage right now. Uh, she works as a sound designer and music maker at On The Outskirts. Let's give her a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I'm uh, Kaisa. And if I remember correctly, my talk is named uh, Using Chaos as a Creative Tool. Uh, I didn't write it on the on the first screen. I should have done that, but uh, I didn't. But yeah, I'm here to talk about how Chaos essentially inspired uh, the sound of a game called Air, Memories of Old. So uh, this is, uh, yeah, this is a little movie I put together just showcasing some of my work. It's a little bit dated because for the last past years I've been working at Massive and now I'm working at Shark Mob and everything there is super confidential. So I had to scrape together a little bit of what I did before everything I did was confidential. <laughs> So that was a little bit of my work, and uh, yeah. So I'm. So my name is Kaisa Larsen, and I'm a music sound designer. And my journey started when I studied digital audio production at uh, Blakey Institute of Technology. And during my studies, I started a company, which was called Forgotten Key. It was a small indie studio at first, which grew. And towards the end of Forgotten Key's time, we were 16 employees. And I handled all the audio and music work. And we're mostly known for a game called Air Memories of Old. And since Forgotten Key, I've also been at Massive. And right now, I'm at Shark Mob. But I'm here mostly to talk about like what inspired the sounds of uh, Air Memories of Old. So. Some bragging, of course, you need to start with some bragging. Uh, at Forgotten Key, we worked with a bunch of cool companies. We got a nice reviews, and we also were nominated for some awards, which was pretty cool. Uh, yeah, yes. And uh, yeah, so here's a, a slide for sound and music in AIR. So AIR started as our thesis project. So during our thesis project, we decided to make a cool game prototype thing, which you can see in the corner up there is like two months into development. Uh, it's like basically a tiny pizza box <laughs> flying around in a bunch of floating islands. Yeah, I, I wonder why we didn't release that instead. That would have been so much cooler. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so uh, because we were students, we had little to no budget. And so everything was basically do it yourself. We didn't have any expensive gear. At the time, we didn't even invest in like Wise because Wise was too ex expensive. So we had 
a plugin for implementation in Unity called Master Audio, which we bought for like 50 bucks off of the asset store, <laughs> which was basically like the audio bu budget back then. Uh, but yeah, so it was a lot of, and as a student, I wasn't, I didn't have a bunch of experience either. So it was a lot of learning by doing and just following my gut feeling and uh, a lot of happy accidents. Like I had no intention for it to sound this way, but now it sounds this way and it's kind of cool. Uh, so it was pretty nice ex just to experiment and uh, have the privilege of having time and not necessarily having money. So like it offered a lot of just weird stuff to happen. Uh, and of course, uh, when you don't have a lot of experience, uh, a lot were thrown away. So I think we changed like genre, like for the music, like four times. We started off with this super synthy, uh, synthy pop uh, M83 vibes, uh, where everything was basically having this pop feeling. And then we changed it to post rock and everything was gonna sound like God is an astronaut. And then we kind of merged all of the previous things and made like a folksy synth soundtrack instead but it was a lot of back and forth and I have so many music sketches from those early days that just didn't end up anywhere uh, I can show you those if you wanted uh, ask me on Twitter so um, but yeah so I'm here to talk about some sound effects so what I did first and foremost was just to set up some basic rules for myself just because it helps when you're like being creative uh, if you don't like have some aim or some goal from at least from my perspective I always like it helps if I don't just have a blank canvas if I have like a word or something that I can focus on or even like a movie or sound collage to that I can experiment from so what I set up I set up some words I set it to be for the most part low-key and also some stylized realism like I wanted you to kind of understand what you're hearing at the same time and also like relate to it on on a realism level but also not to be exactly the way it sounds in real life because that's not and uh, that's not what air was about and i also wanted to contrast those low-key sounds with magical moments for when something larger than life was happening and they didn't always need to be like epic or whatever but just like Magical moments, even if they're low key, just have something like ethereal and nice and make that musical somehow. So that was my goal. And there were some difficulties, of course. I had really bad recording conditions. I've always recorded stuff from my home, which meant that I was recording at first in my living room, uh, which was okay. I mean, a living room, you have a couch, it's absorbing a lot, bunch of sounds. It's not as bad as you would think and then I actually moved so I got my own audio room which was terrible <laughs> it was so nice to have your own room but the room itself was so small and it had very weird dimensions that everything was kind of bouncing all over the place which meant that uh, it was actually really bad for recording which meant that I I ended up going out into the kitchen anyways <laughs> to record uh, or like in the hallway so and now I'm I've moved again, so I'm back in my bedroom. But uh, the bedroom is nice. I, I stick with the bedroom. Uh, so, and also, of course, as audio people, uh, we're most of the time we're last in the process. People come to you and they're like, oh, I added this awesome thing like a month ago and I needed sound for that yesterday. And you're like, oh, you could have told me earlier. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so you're gonna have to deal with that somehow and just try to make everyone aware that audio needs its time to work itself out as well. So some solution, like I had, I had terrible recording equipment and I had ter like a lot of room noise. So I used pretty much isotope denoiser on everything uh, because it just removes those noisy preamp sounds. And I also bought a lot of sound packs from indie sites. So what it allowed me was to like buy more uh, niche sounds. And instead of buying like one giant super expensive pack that has everything, I could like just buy wing sounds or wind sounds or whatever. And it would like, there are still 
they cost money, but they didn't cost as much because I could tailor it to what I needed. Instead, I also experimented a lot because I had the time to, like for instance, we had this lamb, lamba, as we called it, and it it's a this very cute like alpaca meets lamb thing, and I would uh, try so many times to record that sound using my voice and it ended up sounding really bad. I'm not very good at imita imitating a lamp, it turns out, but I would go for like hours, <laughs> upon hours, and it didn't end up sounding as awesome as I intended, but I experimented and sometimes it worked out and sometimes it did not. But uh, yes, so I also, to solve the problem of being last in the process, I asked the animator to record um, like play blasts, which is essentially he, he'd do a work in progress animation, he'd export it and I'd start working on the audio parallel to him and he'd export it like every other day or every couple of days just so I had something to work with along with that. And yes, yeah, sometimes uh, a solution also was sometimes it's better to just have a, have a sound rather than have a perfect sound. So even though I did not have a perfect sound, I always try to have something and make it not suck rather than have a perfect sound. So yeah, so that's what happened. And as you can imagine, I had a lot of shitty gear. <laughs> I have better gear now, like for instance, now I have monitors, which is nice, but I still, I'm so used to working on my headphones that I actually use my headphones most of the time, but now I can at least listen to the monitors and hear what it sounds like. Uh, but yeah, I have, and I still have, only one condenser mic. I have a crappy H4N recording device, which I recorded most of the like footstep sounds on and everything like that. And I have, I don't ha didn't have any mod monitors at the time. I had crappy headphones at the time. Now I have good headphones, so win. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I had, I stole my boyfriend's guitar <laughs> that he had had for the like six years and I made it mine even though it's yeah so I basically stole it and now it's mine don't tell him uh please uh but yeah and I bought some uh, rather like secondhand uh, guitar pedals for it so that I could add reverb to everything because I really love reverb <laughs> reverb my savior and Jesus Christ <laughs> thank you uh yes uh and I had a MIDI keyboard that I bought like five years ago or something. So that was my essential setup at the time and still for the most part is how I record and do stuff uh, at home at least. At, at Shark Mob they have fancier stuff but, uh, but at home it's essentially what I use. So yeah and now we get to the good stuff. So the sound of air is basically a bunch of electric guitars just stapled on top of each other <laughs> using various amounts of reverbs and delays. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I I had I started making a track uh, and I essentially made this track and then I realized, oh, I have so many cool like effects in this session. Like I work in Pro Tools. So I had a bunch of like effects just added in and to Pro Tools, and I realized, oh, wait, now that I'm done with this track, I can use this as like my template for creating chaos, essentially. So I would just uh, go to this session and I'd have my effects loaded in because it's so much nicer to just have the effects pre-made and you can hear the good stuff right off the bat. I'm like, I'm impatient, so I want to hear stuff that's sounds almost like they could be in the game right away, if I can. Uh, so yeah, so that's what I did. And this is the first track that I started with and that I realized, oh, I can use this for more things. So not too spectacular, but there was a 
bunch of reverb in there. There was some crystallizers, there were some filter freaks. So I realized, oh wait, I have a template. I can use this to create chaos. And so I did. I've uh, tried my best for the next couple of, s oh wait. So this is essentially the sound effect I wanted to make a sound for, or the game thing that I wanted to make a sound for. So in the game we have these ghost type of things. And when you approach them, they're ha they have this 3D uh, effect. And I wanted it to be ethereal and kind of low-key, but also like a little bit larger than life. So I wanted it to have like a musical moment. And I wanted to also add in some whispery tones just to make sure that you understand that these were humans once. And uh, yeah, I've tried to recreate like the best Pro Tools experience <laughs> with the, these videos. If I was on my laptop, we would, I would just open up Pro Tools and you'd get a bunch of error, errors uh, because that's the Pro Tools experience, I promise. <laughs> uh, this is better, <laughs> this is videos. Uh, if these videos give off errors, I'm gonna be so mad. <laughs> but yeah, um, so what I do was, what I do, is I'd uh, like go into the session and I just start noodling on the guitar with a bunch of like with all the effects already in there. But for this um, show and tell, I'm gonna go the other way around, just show you the raw sound, so I can add in the effects and show you what it sounds like in the end. And uh, for this sound, so my boyfriend this day was working from home as well, and. It's his guitar, and I was noodling on his guitar. So he was like, wait, can I borrow that for a few seconds and just disturb you? <laughs> and I was like, sure, sure. And he started playing riffs like he always does. It, it's super nice, super sweet and daring uh, when he comes in and interrupts me. Uh, but yeah, and this time I decided to record him, and it actually turned out pretty nice. So it actually, like, I'm so happy that I actually recorded this. But yeah, so this is the completely raw sound. Yeah, so it's just him playing riffs. This is like one of 10 riffs that he always plays. Uh, yeah, and uh, I, when it, so when I actually heard this, so then what I do is I add like just, some EQ, some compressors, just to make it like, yeah, a little bit louder, a little bit less muddy. Still, still has that guitar feel. Uh, so, and then I have have it sent to like a reverb, and I also put a crystallizer on top. And I still don't know like what I'm using this for, but like, I I wouldn't know like from just this. But now it sounds like something. So I, if I just had this, I wouldn't know what to use it for. But I could probably like stretch it, EQ it, like add it somewhere if I wanted to. But then I add last layer of effects. And all of a sudden, I have this tail of sound that's kind of ethereal and kind of nice. So I just cut it off right at the end and only use that tail. And uh, that actually kind of worked because it kind of sounds like a, like a choir or kind of like it has this kind of organic but also a little bit like ethereal sound to it that I thought was kind of nice. So what I did was I started layering this with voices. Uh, because that's what I wanted, like whispered ghost kind of voices. And what I do then is like, I look around me and I see my cat curled up as a little ball. And I think I was tired, a little bit sleepy. And I just, yeah, I was, I kind of also wanted to be a little, little ball. So I just start 
talking into the microphone and I just say in Swedish Jag önskar att jag var en liten, liten boll. <laughs> that's what I go and that's, this is what that sounds like. Jag önskar att jag var en liten boll. Yeah, because you, you need to go like this because it's ghost, right? So, <laughs> ghosts obviously talk like this. Uh, ghost voice is fun. Uh, yeah, and then I think I had watched like Twin Peaks the other day. And they have this really cool effect that they use quite a lot when you're in like the other dimension. Uh, that they they have the vo- people talking, and they're like, but they're talking. They're actually recording the actors talking, like saying the lines in reverse, and then they reverse them. So it sounds like they're saying the words, but the rhythm is off, and like the. The pitch is also off because they're saying everything in reverse, and when you reverse it, like the pitch won't be as as like normal as when you say it like regularly. So w- I wanted to do that because that sounds like fun. <laughs> Who doesn't want to do that? Uh, yeah, so I did that, and I honestly don't think it added a lot of stuff to the game, but. Uh, it was nice and I had a lot of fun, so I don't regret doing it. And I also think that if you like follow your instincts to do a bunch of stupid stuff, every once in a while you're gonna come up with something that's useful and really worth like doing so. And every once in a while it's gonna be a total waste of time, so you gotta like choose your moments. But this is what it sounds like when you say "Jag önskar att jag var en liten liten boll," which, by the way, I don't remember if I said it, means I wish I was a tiny tiny ball. Uh, in reverse, when you speak it into reverse, and then you reverse it in Pro Tools. Yeah. A little ball. Yeah, so that was a lot of fun, and I don't think it added. But it's a bunch of details that, like, to me, when I hear that, I hear, oh, I wish I was a tiny ball. <laughs> and it makes it fun for me, at least. And of course, it being Ghost, uh, and I also wanted some like other languages in there, and I basically only speak Swedish, English, and a little bit of really bad German. Uh, so I chose English because I wanted some other nuances. And of course, with the ghosts, I I whispered whatever I thought a ghost would say. Yeah, I said like. Everything was taken from me. I want it back. Yeah, stupid stuff that I thought would like be ghost-like. <laughs> uh, yeah, and in the end, the ghost sounded like this. Which is kind of nice, like in the game when you go, you hear them from a distance and it's really low and then you go up to them and it increases in in uh, pitch, no, not pitch, volume, volume, very, very big difference. <laughs> uh, and it increases in volume and you find these weird ghosts hang- hanging out. Uh, yeah, and uh, I also, of course, pitched the... Track like the musical noise, so that it would fit with whatever track was playing around it. But yeah, I also used uh, that same Pro Tools session for a bunch of other sounds. So in the game, we have these uh, godlike creatures, and uh, they were also supposed to have sound. And of course, I was just slamming my hand around, like noodling, drawing, like slapping, whatever I could fi- think of. And uh, it came out quite like this. <laughs> and I don't know if I was like intentionally, because I did, don't think that we had necessarily, the int- I didn't make this with the intention of actually creating the god sounds. I was just sort of, at the time, building a library of sounds that I could use and then grab from later. So I made this before and then afterwards I could, oh, this 
works perfectly with that god, and this works perfectly with that god. But yeah, this is what it sounded like with all the effects added on. So when I heard heard those noises, like when I could go back to those noises, I could just pick and choose wh which, whichever sounds I thought worked best. And this is a picture of one of those gods. And uh, here is how it turned out in the game. Yeah, so actually I played it with uh, my sound designer friend just to show him like some stuff I made for the game. And he was like, oh yeah, that whale sound. I heard that in that sound pack. And I was like, no, you didn't. I created that with my guitar. And even if it sounds like one of your standard library sounds, I, I did it all by myself. <laughs> that, was, uh, that was kind of funny to just be able to tell him I did it. Uh, and yeah, so... Um, in the end, it kind of worked out, even though I didn't know what I was doing at the time. So yeah, and here are some other examples from stuff. Uh, let's hear the first one. Yeah, so this was one of those uh, sounds that I still really don't know like how to recreate. I tried to recreate this sound so much because I wanted to make a variation of whatever that was. But anyways, I I still, like that's the beauty and the horror of like just randomly hitting the guitar in different ways that you don't know really how to recreate it if you wanted to. Uh, but yeah, that drone thing inspired one of the tracks that you play in a temple. Yeah, so as with everything in air, I just, I have a cool guitar sound. Let's just layer it with a bunch of other guitars. That's pretty much <laughs> how everything came about. Uh, so another example here. Oh, wait. This was me figuring out in the same session that you could like tune the guitar, like super, like make it super loose, and then just hit the string, and then just slowly, or like hit the string, or I, I, maybe I used an ebo, I don't remember, but it, then slowly like like turning, tuning the guitar up to make a riser, and then you layer the, a bunch of those on top of each other, and you kind of have a cool riser. <laughs> so uh, yes, and lastly. Uh, this uh, drone was made entirely in that project. I might have stretched it a bit, but I just made that, this sound. Yeah, so this one in particular was like very much one of those that I like I made it and I don't really remember making it and then going back to the same session and like, oh wait, this works perfectly with that cutscene. I can basically just grab this and it actually works fairly well with like the scene changes and I can just add some other stuff stuff like on top of that to accentuate some other stuff happening as well. So yeah, this 
nice drawing was made by our game director. <laughs> it was his way of describing my process, uh, which is, to be fair, like not totally, completely away from the truth at the time. Like I, it was very, like I think at the time I was very worried about like because I experimented so much, I was very worried about like not doing the right thing at the right moment and like, oh, did I just waste like a day on making a sound that I don't know if I will use or not? Like I'm uh, freaking out over a bunch of stuff and in the end it kind of worked out anyways. Uh, and I'm, I'm actually, I've worked a lot on my process to make it less anxiety driven and also to fail faster so that I don't spend like a day sounding like a sheep and then <laughs> just throw it all away. Or actually, I did not throw it all away. There is, amongst the sound of other sheep or goats, there is one, one little sound of me sounding like a goat mixed in there that comes out at random. And I imagine it's being like, uh, whenever it comes out, I imagine it being like a ghost sheep going from like one sheep to another sheep to another sheep. So that's my, that's my little story to like, uh, uh, that I tell myself whenever I think, oh, I, wait, I just put a random sound in there that doesn't actually sound like the others. But like, that's how I uh, motivate it. <laughs> I make up tiny stories <laughs> uh, like that. Uh, but yeah, my, my process at the time was rather chaotic and I've tried to make it a little bit more controlled with time and make it fail faster, but also keep that joyous experimentation going as well because I think some of my best ideas have just been like made from not like hindering myself by saying, oh, you can't do that because you don't know how it will end. So yeah, that's how it got that like that. And also some other fun facts from the game. Uh, so like half a year into production or something, like when we were still like newly graduates from school or something, somebody, uh, grabbed some rocks and threw them through our office window and stole our computers. And I was like, whoa, this is cool rocks. <laughs> and I grabbed them <laughs> and I used them to make all the sto stone noises. <laughs> uh, like whenever there's a uh, like rock sound effect, I probably used those rocks to record it. And it's just nice to use rocks that somebody stole your computer with <laughs> somehow. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, other fun facts. I bought all the cornstarch, like, I think it was like 12 or 15 packs at City Gross, which, yeah, I realize that's a weird name now that I say it in English, City Gross. <laughs> it's a grocery store. Uh, yeah, and I bought all of them and people gave me weird looks. But I was recording some uh, snowy sounds, so I desperately needed those. And my boyfriend got some birthday flowers, and I was like, oh, cool, <laughs> can I have them and torture the shit out of them? And he said, okay, because <laughs> he didn't really, he didn't mind, uh, which I was super happy about. And even though my voice acting the sheep didn't work out, I asked my sister to voice act the rabbits because she has a super cute beeps beep sounds that she just made and it turned out really nice. Uh, yeah, so that was my presentation. And if you have any questions, yeah. Well, first a round of applause, right? Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for a really interesting presentation. Uh, and uh, like I said, if you have any questions, you can ask them on Discord. Uh, I don't see anything up on the screen yet, so I have prepared some questions for Ooh. you to start off a little Thank bit. You. First of all, the, the rock story, the <laughs> burglar rocks, that's like the best case of a silver lining I've ever heard. <laughs> like, oh, they just stole our computers, let's use the rocks. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's, it's great, I really appreciate your, <laughs> yeah. your way of looking at you know, the bright side. Um, but you mentioned that like you have some some darlings you had to kill, uh, like some stuff that just doesn't make it in their music, for example. Like what happens to that? Do you, do you find it a, that you're able to leave it, or like do you? So uh, I I keep it on my hard drive, and I just uh, like hope that someday it will come to life. And every once in a while I use it. Uh, like the other month I was 
looking through my old archive and I found a really interesting sound. That was one of the first sounds that I made for air. And I was like, cool, I can use this in music. And then I just grabbed it. So, but yeah, most of the time, all the stuff I throw out ends up just lost in a hard drive somewhere. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it can be hard though. Like you almost have to tell yourself, like it's fine. It's not dead. <laughs> it might come alive. It might be a zombie. You know? <laughs> exactly. So you can let it go. Definitely. Exactly. It's yeah. super hard. And yeah, I think I just, I wanted to keep some of the sounds in there, and and it just didn't work. So last minute, you just replace it with something else mm. because you're so reluctant to let go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and you mentioned a little bit about like building, like what your studio looks like, and like what equipment someone you use like what to someone who is building maybe their first like gathering the first equipment equipment stuff like that like what what should they focus on like is there something they really need and what is less important yeah so for me uh, I use a lot of pretty heavy plugins like uh, like a lot of synthware plugins and stuff so I always focus on plugins and I focus on getting a really beast computer because it needs to power up all those uh, long, big sessions with a lot of plugins and stuff. So I focus on the uh, computer and the software, and then I focus on things that inspire creativity. So instead of like buying another EQ or another compressor, I might buy a weird uh, plugin that modulates the sound in different ways so that I can get a completely different sound that I couldn't have gotten like in another, other, any other way. I always like think creativity before I think like uh, another EQ or stuff. Mm. Cool. We have a question here. Uh, how do you test sound with people? In gameplay design we need to test mechanics. Uh, how can we do that on sound feelings? Yeah, that's actually a super interesting question. Uh, and it is super difficult because you don't necessarily, people don't always notice sound, especially not if you're playing the game for the first time. And it's especially if it's like like a normal Q&A setup and people are wearing like headphones and they're focusing on tr like learning gameplay and stuff. You can't always get proper sound data out of that. What I do is I, I most of, for, first and foremost, I need to, think that the sound works by myself and then I need to speak to the rest of the team like the animators and the programmers and like I really value their opinion because they're so familiar with the game and uh, like they know what they're after and of course sometimes I choose to completely ignore that and then I bring in like someone and try and set up like a Q&A sort of thing where they can listen and but most of the time you want to do all that and then you don't have time to do that anyways <laughs> so uh, and you I just most of the time I just go with my gut feeling and what like the game designers think cool uh, when you design sound, uh, do you use a framework for designing it? If so, which? Uh, I'm not sure I understand what you mean by framework. Do you mean like software or do you mean like the process? Um, uh, for software, I do most of my work in Pro Tools and I use a lot of like sound toys plugins and reverbs from Valhalla and stuff. And for as for pro process, I try to uh, make as many variations of a sound as possible, like trying a bunch of different things and seeing what fits best with the, with, with whatever I'm doing right now. Uh, yes. Right, I think maybe one more question. Uh, there's nothing up there, so I will take this one. Yes. Uh, so you worked like on Forgotten Keys. Uh, you have worked on Massive, right? And yes. now you're with Shark Mob. Can you like describe the difference between working for a smaller studio that you co-founded <laughs> uh, and now working on a small on a bigger studio? Like, what's the difference? I, the biggest difference is I think there are a lot of more like people to consider. Like when you're making a sound for like a small studio, you you always know that like the people you always aware of like the people you can talk to them in a much more frequent manner and when you're at a s bigger studio you have to consider like what does the game director think what does the audio director think of the sound what is the like when i worked at indie i was the audio director so i considered 
like, what do I think about this? But now there are m more many, like a lot of chefs to keep like happy and uh, a lot of people to take in consideration. Like when I make a sound, do, does this work well with this gameplay mechanic? Does it overpower something else? Like it's a lot more like nuanced, I think, to work in a bigger company and bigger, bigger setup. Well, thank you so much. Another round of applause for Kaisa. Thank you. Uh, and you're staying here on stage. I'm going to let you yes. go over there because we have Vila here as well. And we're going to have Carl, who's joining us over Zoom, because we're going to prepare for a little bit of a panel up here on stage. And please be careful. Don't fall backwards. It's going to be. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want anyone falling off stage during the panel, please. <laughs> um, I'm going to go over here, I think. I'm walking out of the screen, but that's fine, hopefully. And let's see if uh, Carl is ready to join us. Or meanwhile, we can just have a nice little chat together. How are you feeling? I'm feeling pretty good. Oh, there he is. Oh, hi. Nice. Hello. Hello. Hello, Hello Carl. It's so good of you to join <laughs> us. How are you feeling, Carl? I'm good. It's very rainy here. Oh, it's really rainy. I don't know what it's like that's here. That's how I feel. It's rainy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You can go outside and record some uh, some rain sounds. Maybe you yeah, already have the ones you need already. No, uh, you ne you ne can never get enough rain sounds. <laughs> okay, so let's get ready and let's get this party started. So you already know Kaisa, uh, who had had his talk. Uh, um, we also have uh, joining us uh, Carl Flynn from Landfall, and we have Vilja Hartmann. But I think maybe you should introduce yourselves a little bit more. So, do you have any extra case that you want to add to what you just said, or no? Oh. Yeah. Everyone Hello. knows you already. Again. So, yeah. Carl, do you want to to introduce yourself a little bit? Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I can't really see the audience, but <laughs> so nice to see you. Uh, <laughs> so, my name is Carl Frodin. I work as the composer and sound designer at Landfall Games in Stockholm. We made games like um, Cluster Truck, Totally Accurate Battle Simulator, Stick Fight. I don't know if you recognize any of them, but th these are some of the games we worked on. And uh, I started in Skövde 2011 to 2014. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's me, I guess. I live in Stockholm. Awesome. And um, Villa? Uh, yeah, I'm a freelance sound designer. Um, I have a company called Sonigon uh, with my colleague Victor, and uh, we work here in in Kodde as well. Cool. Thank you all so much. So, uh, all right, you already talked a little bit about it, Kaisa, but uh, the rest of you too. Uh, could you please like tell us a little bit about how you got your current job and what the process was like to uh, to get started in industry? Should I start? Sure. <laughs> um, go ahead. Yeah, I. Um, uh, I was working on a, on a game project uh, with uh, a couple of uh, students at the university and uh, it didn't work out, but I had um, scouted a, a, a guy who was uh, like um, a fellow student in my, in my year who was like, he was carrying his like uh, keyboard and his like desktop computer to school every day because he didn't like the hardware. So <laughs> I was like, this guy is crazy. I, I want to I wanna know more about him. That's how I met my, my colleague. Um, and uh, yeah, I, uh, I mean, the last like year of university, we were, I mean, I, I was kind of looking into like, what, what, what am I supposed to do? Um, so I, I, I said to Victor, I was like, hey, let, let's, let's try to do something. And uh, we saved uh, a lot of like, um, uh, you get like, uh, yeah, student loans basically when you study at the university. So we we uh, saved that as much as we could, and then we had a really like small indie project that a couple of friends were making, um, and uh, yeah, we got some money from that as well. And then we basically lived on like beans and tomato sauce for <laughs> six to seven months until uh, I got my first real project on flipping that. So uh, this is how I got, I got started. Cool. Uh, and Carl, what's your story? Yeah, so um, I was very into game jamming when I started in Skövde. I went to a ton of game jams, both in Skövde and I traveled. I basically saved as much money as I could from the CSN to spend the rest traveling to conferences and game jams and stuff like this. 
And from there, I met a bunch of people and got some contacts to start doing some freelance stuff. And uh, and I like we also we had a bunch of projects with fellow students stuff like this that they, that all kind of died out. Uh, but uh, eventually, I got enough jobs to freelance. But I kept game jamming and going to stuff like this. And then I met um, Willem and Phil for the founders of Landfall. I met them through game jamming. And, uh, and we connected pretty well. And then I had a project and I started working with them. And that's basically how it, yeah, that's how it's going. <laughs> <laughs> so game jams and getting to know people, basically. Yeah. Yeah, basically. Uh, so, what does a day at work look like for you? Maybe, Kaisa, you want to start? Yeah, it can be really different depending on what I'm working on. But uh, most of it... Uh, what does it look like? I go into the office, I look into Jira, <laughs> see what my tasks are for the day. And then, depending on what it is, I spend the day like uh, either creating sounds or implementing sounds, or sometimes I remix music, like stems, remix, make them, like add them, make them so you can add them into into set game, or like um, whatever, like it, it varies very differently depending on the day, but most of the time I'm probably implementing stuff. How about you, Willa? Um Well, I wake up at, uh, I don't know, it depends. I mean, <laughs> I get my eight hours of sleep, I'll say that. But uh, I try to wake up between 8 and 10, and then I uh, get up and go to the office and say hello to my colleague. And then uh, we usually work on, like, um, uh, like I usually have, like, a... Like a uh, made I make all the planning like at like intervals, so I make like a two week plan maybe uh depending on what I'm working on and then so i, I I'm usually pretty set uh what I'm gonna do in the mornings because I'm pretty bad you know at like uh, like um, micromanaging my planning, so I like to like you know stake it out like I'm gonna make all of these like a huge list and then just like grind them out one by one um, yeah, it's a pretty typical day, and then when I start to like taper off at the end of the evening. I usually go to the gym for an hour or so. Uh, we have a really good gym here in Hovde, like, uh, like in a cellar. <laughs> and I work uh, usually pretty late, so I'm always alone, which is great, to be honest. Um, yeah, and uh, then I go home, basically. It's a pretty standard day for me. Mm. I like that you mentioned getting enough sleep and actually exercising. <laughs> I think it's easy to forget, especially when you're new in industry. Like you just want to focus, you just want to, you know. Oh yeah, and um, also it's a perk of being a freelancer for sure. I mean, I I don't have like I have my clients. Um, you know, I I don't want to sleep too long because I want to be available on Slack if they're like write to me in the mornings. I mean, people work regular hours. You know, I have to respect that. Uh, so I try to you know, wake up <laughs> at the time when uh, they would like start writing to me if there's something that's crashed or whatever in the in the day before. Um, but yeah, other than that, like just try to take care of myself as <laughs> good as possible, uh, not stress out too much. That sounds great. How about you, Carl? What is life like in the landfall villa? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not there that often because my studio is in town. All right. Okay. Uh, yeah, but... Uh, but I, I really recognize both what Kaisa and Billy are saying. Like, uh, I also like making lists. It's really great. Uh, and uh, also like this divide between uh, creating stuff and implementing. And then also there comes uh, some administrative things that you always have to do as well. When you have more, I don't know, um, like you, when you're more involved in running the company, there's always some administrative stuff that you need to do, which I... Uh, took a very long time to get used to. In the beginning, when I was starting doing the company, it was a mess. I'm very lucky <laughs> that uh, I didn't get too many fines. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, otherwise, yeah, and I also totally agree with getting enough sleep, exercising, and um, eating good food. It's uh, really important, I think. Because... Yeah, 
Yeah, I just, I just, it's really funny with the food thing. I have a really vivid memory of when we made enough money to not eat like beans every day. It's like, yeah. it's stuck <laughs> in my mind. It's like, yeah. it's just like, oh, wow, yeah. like, I can buy like creme friche. Like, that was like <laughs> insane yeah. for me. Yeah. yeah, it was, it was pretty funny for us because up until we released Cluster Truck, I was basically living on like, I don't know, less than 10,000 a month budget, yeah. like less than CSM budget. But then after we released Cluster, like, it was a huge hit. Uh, so then I was like, oh my God, I have a like pretty decent normal salary now. What do I do with myself? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, just cooking good food, like eating healthy is really important. Um, even as a student, I try to do that as much as possible too. Um, but otherwise, you know, I it, like, like I said, it depends on what you're working on. Like if I'm very involved in finishing some um, songs for a soundtrack, it's going to look in one way. Or if I'm more working on just grinding out a list of sound effects, it's going to be one thing. So it's very varied like this. Uh, but yeah. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's, it, that's it basically. Cool. So uh, what was the biggest surprise for you when you joined the games industry? Like, what did you expect and how did it turn out? Uh, for me, it was uh, the aspect of like, oh, like, this is just like, I mean, it's basically... A bunch of people that are like friends on different levels. Like it's not, it's not, you know. When I was younger, I thought, like, oh, business. I'm gonna do business. Like this is gonna be serious. You know, this is gonna be like people in suits, and um, it's gonna be like, you know, cutthroaty. Like oh, like uh, you're hired, you're fired, like that sort of stuff. You know, Mad Men basically or something. If you've seen that series, but it, it's nothing like that. I mean, I would say like networking in this industry, at least it's like you go there, you go to things like, you know, events and you, you make friends. You never try to sell yourself or be like, you know, a salesman because that's not, I mean, like uh, I would say that, I mean, if you would follow an account on Twitter, like would you, would you want to follow an, an ad account? <laughs> you want to be friends with someone who's like trying to sell you something? I mean... And uh, yeah, and also like, um, uh, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> what, what, uh, what was unexpected? Like, what did you not oh, expect? Yeah, uh, I didn't expect it to be so friendly, I guess. I mean, I definitely think you have a point, and I think it's good to remember when you first joined the industry or when you're trying to break into an industry uh, that you make friends and don't, like, you can probably get kind of stressed, like, I really need to get my first job. And like, you go up to people like, hi, are you hiring? But uh, I mean, this is a marathon and not a sprint. And like, while it might be um, like stressful right now to, to make friends, like you say, and mm. like really network and like really get to know people, that's going to help you in the long run because that's what's going to bring you to, you know, the better jobs in the future. And, yeah, exactly. You know. and, I, and I think that the... the the stress you're talking about is, is something that's real. You really have to deal with it. Like, and, and it can be hard to sort of, you know, relax and be yourself and be personable when you're like, oh, like, oh I'm bleeding to death. You know, I'm gonna, I'm, I, can I still work with this? Mm. And I think you sort of have to find the calm in, in like being in a, in, a, in a stressed situation because like, you know, if you're talented and if you just, you're persistent and, and you're like a nice person, then you're, I think, I think you are going to make it or at least have a very high chance of doing that. And you have to be open to new possibilities and new, like, um, you know, like I think success is, it's, it's uh, usually pretty like, um, it's not how you expect it to be. Like, it's not like you talk to an important person and they're like, oh, you're hired. Oh, nice. Now it's, everything's done. You're like, you meet someone and then you're friends with that person. And then some like fourth person that you'd never even considered is like, oh, I'm looking for work. And then, you know, all these like nodes in your social network, like sort of ping back to you. So mm. it's, uh, it's unexpected. Definitely. Do you have anything to add, Carl or Kais, on this? Uh, yeah, I think I was most surprised and still am surprised by how complex it is to make a game. <laughs> oh, yeah. And how, like, even though you have so many, you gain so much experience, and so it never ceases to amaze me, like, how nobody ever really knows what they're making until it's done. Like, uh, even... Like it's so complex and it's so intricate, and sometimes there are so many people involved, and sometimes there's only a few people. But you have a vision, and that vision is usually way off. <laughs> and then you keep make you're making something else, and uh, yeah, it's it's a very complex process, and it's 
it's very uh, it amazes me all the time just how how something that you thought was going to be this way turned out to be this way instead mm. Carl do you have any an experience I completely agree with what you said but I have an extra thing it's for me the most unexpected thing was that it's even possible to make a living out of doing it <laughs> 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 like yeah. when I when I when I applied in Hovde it was the first year that they even had sound as a because before it was like uh it was bundled together with the arts graphics, and uh, and at the time I was like, no way you can make a living making music for <laughs> computer games. It's just it's just like no. But so my plan, I actually applied for game design first because I wanted to be like a level designer or a game designer, but I didn't come in. I only had only a second option, and then my plan was like, okay, but maybe I come here and I'll magically learn game design while studying audio or something like this. So I. I was actually focused on, like, I was trying to learn how to make games and trying to get things going. And then I was like, wait, I, I can actually work as an audio person. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you did it. Awesome. Um, so what are some things that you wish that you knew back in, when you were in school uh, that you didn't know? What would you tell your past self? It's kind of a difficult question. Um, I think uh, experience, uh, like it's it's like a learning process. Like I don't think if I told like some of the things I've learned that I would really absorb it. You know, it's like what? That's not no. That's not how it works. Like come on. <laughs> no, especially because a lot of the things that you learn, you learn from doing the mistakes. Kind yeah. Of. Yeah. So it's like if you would teach, if you would tell yourself it, it would be counterproductive, kind of. Yeah, yeah if, if it makes sense. Yeah, uh, I think like the mistakes I've made at least are like a part of. Uh, I mean, the factor that makes me not repeat them is that they were a bit painful. Like you know, you get burned a little bit, and you're like, oh, damn, that that hurt. I don't want to do that again. Uh, and if you would just like, and th that's why it can be hard to like absorb like tips sometimes. Because I mean, like. I, if you're like making games, I guess like the number one thing is like, oh, you shouldn't feature creep. And all the like groups I was in the university, they were like, oh, we're not gonna feature creep. And then they are feature creeping. Like it's just natural. Like you have to learn by doing, basically. Yeah, definitely. Like experience is the best experience, right? And like you, that's the way you learn. And, like failure, I are the, you know this is the quote: failure is only failure if you don't learn from it. Yeah. Otherwise, it's just experience. I mean, I mean, yeah, getting burned is amazing. I love fucking up like it's great <laughs> and i mean if, if if you do something that's awesome people are gonna say like oh that's that's really good wow thumbs up you know but if you have like if you have a failure in any capacity then you have like a crime scene you know you have a dead body and you can sort of like analyze it and you can say oh ooh, this really shit let's not do that again and stuff like that i i i i really enjoy failures in a lot of ways for yeah. sure I mean, I guess you can say the key to success is to just keep going and like oh, yeah. making the next game and like just surviving to make another game, basically, not leaving the industry because oh no, I fucked up. I'm I'm not you know suited for this. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think if I were to take it away, anything like from when I was a student, I would like put in the hours, like because I know a lot of people didn't uh, at the time when I was uh, in a university, at least. Uh, but don't overwork yourself, like don't burn out from studying. I know a lot of people who do that as well, so like try to keep it balanced. And also, I know I am I can be very nervous, and so this is what I probably say to myself, which is ironic because I just hold a talk, held a talk about experimentation, but in the beginning I think I was uh, too afraid to experiment. Uh, so it took me a while before I actually started like trying stuff and like just because I was afraid of getting burnt, like you said, like, mm -hmm. what if this doesn't sound good? What if it sucks? And But yeah, just get it out of there. Like, you're going to get better with time. It's everyone sucks in the beginning. Yeah, and, and I think, yeah. Uh, yeah, just a really quick one. Like, the thing you said is consistency. Mm. Like, you're not supposed to work, like, 16 hours one day and then be burnt out and then, you know, be bummed out and shit. Like, just put down the hours. Yeah. And, and be consistent. You know, exactly. I interrupted you, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I was going to say I totally agree with that's probably the, the one thing that would have been really helpful to hear when I started was don't be afraid to 
uh, put stuff out, like show people stuff, mm-hmm. and uh, because this was also something that I was nervous about in the beginning. And but once I started uh, showing people things more often, I was like, why didn't I do this earlier? It's so much more nice and so much more productive uh, to get people's like input, basically. Uh, like feedback for me is a huge part of what I do, and uh, I'm lucky enough to have a have a colleague that's like he's much more technical minded than me. Like uh, I try to think about like you know the expression or the emotion, and then I play my stuff, and he's like, oh, it's it's a bit off in the 600 hertz region, and I'm like, oh wow, like this is not <laughs> how I would approach things. But but definitely like different perspectives, and people like sometimes when I show people stuff. They're like, oh, like, yeah, I'm not a sound designer, so I don't really know. I'm like, no, that's exactly the feedback you want. You want people who are like, don't know anything about the technical process and just like, you know, are reacting to it like naturally. That's 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 what you want. I don't want like, I mean, sound designer uh, feedback is great too, but like, the you want the people who are like going to consume your your product. You want their opinion. That's the most important one, I think. Mm, Great. Uh, speaking of uh, like showing people or playing your stuff to people, well, what should a good um, portfolio sound like for an audio designer or music or a composer from Core Games? My portfolio sucks. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought I was gonna like. Oh, you're probably, <laughs> probably great. Like. <laughs> no, no, we haven't really put down that much. Um, time on our portfolio because uh, I mean we've been pretty busy to be honest like the last two years have been pretty packed and uh, uh, most of our work comes from like word of mouth and like uh, within like the Swedish game industry so we don't have to do a lot of marketing so I mean our website is functional you can see everything we worked on but it's not like we don't have a show reel you know and it's just because of like our uh, like situation or like where we're at Mm. I yeah I think I I got the tip which I didn't follow by the way <laughs> but to have like a landing page and just show your greatest work in one show reel uh, and I don't have it I have like a page with every project I've worked on like you can click on stuff and then you come to each project but I think uh, like try and uh, put as little in there but as much quality content as possible like really highlight your strengths and also uh, focus on like not only sound design but also focus on like a lot of people want implementation so showcase your implementation skills and uh, if you can't know anything besides uh, like scripting or whatever like try and showcase that as well yeah i I totally agree with what you said i remember like one time uh we had uh, a guy we showed him our website and we could see what he did and he like went into like we had a huge huge playlist uh like a soundcloud playlist and it was like a lot of things in there and he went in there like went to it was like in the bottom it was a really bad iteration of our website but it was like in the bottom and then we had this huge playlist and he went to the bottom he went to the like the last parts of the playlist and played those songs so it's like (laughs) if you have less things you have less like you know randomness you have less like unknown factors basically Uh, so yeah i totally agree with that you know keep it short and quality yeah we we had um uh, an artist earlier talking today like your portfolio is never better than like the worst in your portfolio so like if you have all of that and then you scroll to the bottom maybe that's like shouldn't even be on the list but like let's put it there mm-hmm. like that's the only thing they're going to hear in that case because they're not going to listen to all of it so definitely i i think it's a very good good input good feedback do you have anything to add to carl on this one um yeah like billy said i don't really have too much experience from getting job from portfolios myself because i never made one uh <laughs> i only have like i put up my my music on spotify so like this but this is after i got jobs but but i do get sent a lot of like internet applications and stuff like this, and uh, people who want to uh, work and things like this. And um, the, from the one I've seen, from the, like my takeaway, because I look at all of them, even though we don't really, uh, I've had one intern and, I, and it's very, I don't, we don't really have plans to have more at the moment. Uh, sorry, everyone. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, but, but you can still apply because if the, the thing is like this, um, if, you have a portfolio that is concise, like you guys said, like it needs to show something nice really quickly. 
I don't care if you have made 50 projects. I'm not going to look at those. But if you show something really quick that's really unique, but the most important thing is you need something that showcases your personality. If I get a, if I see a portfolio that is like, I get a feeling for this, that there's a nice person behind this, then I'm more interested in taking on something than if it's just like, this is talented sound design number 30. I have no idea who this is. Like, it's more important to have something interesting about the person, I think, than to have a perfect technical ability because perfect technical abilities you can learn with practice. But having like an interesting outlook, interesting creativity uh, is more like unique and more desirable. Yeah, and also like, uh, I, I'm always amazed at how, because I also like back when I was in the I also got a lot of applications, not only from sound designers, but from like, but you get a lot from sound designers, uh, and a lot of people just send uh, a standardized like, hey company, I made this, look at this, uh, and it's like uh, very standardized, and you, you can always see when somebody just copy pasted, and sometimes they get the name wrong. Uh, the company name wrong and sometimes they like literally write hey company uh, never do that because uh, unless they're like super looking for people like they really need people but even then like i don't think they will hire you because you're not like putting in the effort and you're not like you don't want to really want to go there you just want to go somewhere and the company is going to notice that and they want you to go they want you to want to come here like to the the company. They don't want just somebody who wants to work with sound. They want someone who wants to work at the specific company. They don't want a person who doesn't even bother writing the right company name in the title. Yeah. So that's like borderline rude cold emailing has become almost like a meme <laughs> uh, that audio, audio people do this. So people need to get to get better with this, I think. <laughs> yeah. And if you're gonna send like a like a like a not not a customized but like a standardized mail make it interesting and make sure to write the company name and make sure to put a little bit of yourself in there and like if you're you can standardize like a like a piece of like the bit about yourself but always like end and start with something personal to the company so like pieces of it you can standardize because you want to express who you are but like make sure to mention maybe some games they worked on or maybe like something that makes you want to work there. Hmm. Yeah, I w just want to add to this. Like um, when we we go to a lot of like conference or not a lot, we go to Nordic Game Conference and, and uh, Gamescom mostly. Or that's where we've been going for the last couple of years when we've been active. But like uh, after the conference, I would usually have like a huge stack of of um, business cards, and uh, every single like I wrote to every single one. Uh, and I always made it personable. Like I remember like some detail or something that we talked about. And I mean, the reason why I remember those things is because I'm interested, you know, like that's, that's basically what it's about. It's about just like being interested and, and, and just being like personable, you know, like, hey, oh, hey, by the way, this thing that you made is great. And or like, oh, this thing that we talked about, you know, whatever, like just and it doesn't have to be much, just yeah. like a, just like a line or something. And if you're, yeah, if you're and but also like, I mean, if you're cold ema emailing companies for work, like that's hard. Like, and mm. and I get that uh, it can be a lot of frustrating uh, uh, or like very frustrating. And uh, but like, if you if you channel that frustration out on your potential clients, I mean, that's that's never gonna work. <laughs> No, definitely. I, I I want to chime in on this as well because I've also seen a lot of applications and especially a lot of cold emails because we don't actually hire. Uh, and like getting this is not just for audio people, but like when you get the email like, I'm looking forward to working with your team of senior developers. I'm like, <laughs> if you would have taken one minute to go into our webpage, look at the about page, you know that we have one full time employee, which is me. So I'm like <laughs> the team of. Where does this person know something that I don't? You're so, so like, just senior. You <laughs> may yeah, like, yeah. I'm an entire team on my own. So like, just it shows that you haven't even gone into our webpage. You have no idea what we're doing. Why? Like, if you can't even bother to know who you're applying to, how do I know that you will be engaged enough to work on our games and you know 
make it a better game. So like literally five minutes, that's all it takes. Just yeah. know what is this company, how many are they, what games have they made? Like it's that simple basically. Yeah, I we know Forgotten Key got a lot of sound uh, designer people who like didn't bother to know that we already had a sound designer. They were like, oh, but if you don't have a sound designer, here I am. and. I we get this at home too. Yeah, and that's like, uh, that's just like, you could have like checked. That's probably, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we're, we're all are on the topic of like, how to apply for a job. Like, what are some things you should do? Like some best practices or like tips they want to share when you, when, when you want to break into the industry. Uh, so we talked about some don'ts, what are some do's? Be nice, yeah. just be a nice person. Like. Don't be rude. Uh, like, don't try to like I don't know, cheat or trick people. I don't know. Like, it's pretty like it's it's pretty basic. I, I think. Um, like, the number one reason why people want to hire you, I think, is that you're pleasant to work with. Uh, skill, uh, you know, experience and stuff like that. That comes after. To be honest, I mean, of course, it's important. You're supposed to know what you're doing. You're supposed to, uh, you know, produce quality stuff. But I think. People who are looking for new employees, people who, and and uh, are looking for you know uh, to hiring freelancers or whatever, they're looking for people that are easy to work with, uh, and they're looking for people who can understand like the the basic like creativity uh, and not so much the technical ability. Uh, yeah, I think I agree. I've like back when we were uh, expo going to different expos and different places, uh, there would always be like one or two or sometimes even more, and th this would happen to other teams as well, but uh, to students who'd just come up to you and they'd crit criticize your work in front of you and then they say, like, hire me! <laughs> and I'd be like, but you just came up to me and criticized my work, why, why would I, like, wh we didn't, like, have a good moment here. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, don't do that. <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's move on a little bit about like audio in general. So like you, you mentioned a little bit in your talk guys about like how perhaps an artist might come very much too late sometimes like just ask for a sound. Like um, what are some challenges that you face as audio designers and composers and like how can other disciplines help you? And how can, how can we be better when working with an audio designer? Uh, yeah, I think uh, people need to take audio more seriously. And people need to just get a broader, ex like, look at, like, I think every discipline needs to, like, understand, like, a little bit about the other disciplines. And I think, especially audio often gets taken for granted. Like, a lot of people expect us to just, uh, oh, you, you probably just grab a sound from anywhere and you just put it in and it takes, like, five minutes. But that's, it takes a whole lot of work and a lot of work goes into it, I think audio needs deserves some respects and i think it's so easy to just oh i made this new feature of course this is going to need audio so we need to include the audio people uh from the start and the get go and i think uh if people were just more like just knew more about audio i think it would have been easily solved yeah i, yeah, I yeah. The uh, go on, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. It, uh, so, so the the way that I try to do, or we try to do at Lampo, to include audio more is, I I don't really try to think of it as like, oh, we make a list. Here's the sounds what that we need, but instead look at each uh, like moment in the game and think how would sound make this better, basically. Like what information or what emotional stuff is communicated or enhanced to the player in this moment. And in this way, I think it's easy to get people engaged in the rest of the team with the audio. Uh, and it also demonstrates the value easier instead of just because, I mean, it's very easy to demonstrate the value of a sound effect. Like if you have big speakers and can play a cool sound effect, everyone's going to be like, whoa, you know, but, but you don't always have this. If you're in the office, you can't really show someone the sound like this. Then you have to put it into like a framework or something like this in that you have to be able to explain the place of the sound in the game. And the, and like you said, this this gets better if you know more about the other disciplines. The more you know about the other part, things of the game, the more you know how to fit audio into this and the more you can promote it. 
that's my philosophy yeah and, and i i agree with both of you and i think that um like the most important thing uh, that a like a uh, team that you're working with can do for like the sound uh, department it's just like you know make sure like you're speaking the same language you know in like the the directional uh, aspect of it because i i mean and uh, for me at least like when i have the direction set i like I try to sketch it as much as much as possible because like that decision like oh this like oh we're going to do like some research in the beginning and we're going to decide oh this is how we're going to this is how it's going to sound like that small like planning session dictates you know all of the grind that comes after when you actually make the 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 actual like products actually the sound effects and and, and that's um like uh, that part of it is so important and that if you can nail that down with the sound department and make sure like you know you're speaking the same language you're going the same direction then you don't have any accidents where you've like you know made half of the sounds and it's like oh this is not what we were talking about and then it's like oh, oh crap you know like and that that's that's both on the team and the sound designers you know like that's a two-way thing yeah. uh, but I, I think that's really important you know nailing down the direction Definitely. Cool. Yeah. Uh, we've been talking a little bit about uh, inspiration during the day here. So, like, as audio people, like, what inspires you? Like, how does that process look like? F getting some inspiration and, and, like, making, you know, designing the audio based on that. Can you talk a little bit about that? I, I like you know real life like i'm walking through a tunnel and all of a sudden like you just hear all of the reflections at once and it's like super trippy and then you exit the tunnel and the whole thing the effect goes away and you're like holy crap like that was insane like i could never recreate this in like a, <laughs> in like a, in like a, in my computer you know like that that's that's really inspiring like real life is weird and it sounds really weird and there's a lot of things in real life that i wouldn't you know sound design the way it sounds like i was walking past the construction site and there was a like a like a digger and when it turned like it's a huge it's a huge digger with on, on like caterpillar tracks and it turned really slowly really dramatically with a huge scoop on it no sound no turning sound. It was just a loud motor sound. I was like, this, this is bad implementation. Like, <laughs> this is badly done. Who made this? It's a bug. <laughs> I would have a cool, like, <laughs> like, a really, you know, dramatic thing, but no, nothing. And that's mm. surprising. And, um, like, you know, that juxtaposition of reality versus, you know, expectation is, is where I got to get a lot of inspiration. And I, I really enjoyed that part of your talk as well. Like, I think one of the hardest things for a sound designer is to make sounds that are unrealistic but make sense like that and like making sounds that maybe aren't that fit but aren't expected of a thing you know it's really hard and i struggle with that like every day yeah it's super it's super weird and you gotta <laughs> grab inspiration when it gets to you like yeah. when you yeah, I mean, you, you use the reverb tail from a guitar riff. <laughs> I mean, that's so random, but like, <laughs> that's that's so true. Like, you you try you. I mean, you never expect where you end up in a lot of like those types of things when you're trying to be creative. You're like, you make something and then it turns into another thing, and then oh, you take the reverb tail from the thing I was trying to make, and oh, this is great. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, agreed. We have just about a minute left. I want to hear, because you talked about your stone story, Kaisa, which I still love, but uh, from <laughs> Carl and Mila, do you have any like funny stories about like how you made effects? Like we, we've seen sometimes for movies, someone how they smash pumpkins and stuff like that to make the audio. Do you have any like funny stories of how, how you made a sound? I'll go, Carl. Yes. I, I used a fidget spinner, if you remember them. Uh, the fidget spinners? The, yeah, the, brrr, the thing, because the thing is like this, it, if you put it really close to your ear, you know, it makes a huge bass sound oh. uh, because of the rotation is going so fast. It's making a tone, like it's a 40 hertz tone or something like this. <laughs> and, the, and I noticed that this is a really cool sound with the, the bass plus the mechanical spinning and stuff. So I recorded this really close to a very sensitive mic. And then I used this, I put it in a sampler and I played around with it. I got like, I think almost like in stick quite almost like 30% of the sound effects, of the special sound effects, like explosions and things like this, is made from this sampler <laughs> patch of a fidget spinner. Nice. Uh, wow. So that this is, um, yeah, you, that, like you said before, listen to the real world, you find good stuff. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, and the tiny sounds are great. Like, really, really, like, uh, that's a really, like, hidden sound designer, like, tip, I guess. It's like, 
when you try to record big things, use a really, really, really sensitive mic and make really small movements and then like pitch them down and like they will sound really crazy. Um, yes. Close miking overall is amazing. Oh, like yeah. close mic anything and you get completely new sound worlds. Yep. And also <laughs> distance as well. If you want if you want the sound of like something distance cannot like play with distance both close and far. Mm -hmm. It's really good advice. Do you have anything final do you want to add before we wrap this up? No, not really for me. Not really. Um, no. Okay, sir, Carl. This was fun. Yeah, it was really <laughs> fun. Yeah, really so. fun. Cool. Well, then, thank you so much for this panel. It was great. Uh